In today's episode, from the Cossack Republic of Poland, you will witness the twilight of not one, but two empires, and the birth of a mighty commonwealth. Poland in the 16th century is definitely one of the most powerful countries in the world. However, the Ottoman threat continues to grow and our eastern border leaves much to be desired. It is a prosperous country with a truly formidable army and capable commanders, especially the mighty hussars and Cossack cavalry. In the country, there is a widespread contentment among the estates who support their ruler. And the current ruler of our beautiful republic is Bartłomiej Sobieski. He has already begun promoting Polish culture in territories like eastern and western Prussia. He has also started promoting Polish culture in Lithuanian territories. As for the culture in the former Lithuanian territories, here the Ruthenian culture is being promoted. However, some provinces still need to be converted to Protestantism. But why does Bartłomiej act this way? It's because only cultures that enjoy the ruler's acceptance and trust have the right to raise hussar regiments. And hussars are truly outstanding cavalry. Unfortunately, like every ruler of an empire, our ruler must decide which cultures will dominate. And our ruler's dream is to field an entire army of winged hussars who will break the ranks of our enemies. Yes, the light Cossack cavalry will serve as our support. Diplomats have also been sent to the electors of the Holy Roman Empire to improve relations with them and establish future alliances. The empire is weak and this is a good moment for its dissolution, especially since German territories are quite prosperous and there will be ample opportunity to spread Polish culture. The Polish army, when not engaged in warfare, focuses on training to increase the professionalism of our army, which is currently quite low. The port in Gdansk has been expanded, becoming the gateway of Poland to maritime trade. Well, it will certainly enrich us to some extent. Special edicts have been introduced to facilitate the conversion of the Belarusian population to Protestantism. Economic matters. I think we will adopt a mercantilist approach to development. Free trade, jesting aside, solely focused on exports. And these reforms have significantly increased our trade revenues. Poland has formed alliances with the electors in the Holy Roman Empire, except for two countries, Bohemia and Munich. It has been successful thanks to the efforts of our diplomacy. Fortunately, this duchy is an ally of Austria, and if Bohemia is attacked by Poland, they will call upon the emperor for defense, and the emperor will call upon Munich. That's why Polish forces have ceased training, because they have started preparing for the upcoming war. The development of the printing industry, the ability to mass produce written words, disseminate information, and in many ways, early modern society as a whole. Everything is changing in Poland. It's a good moment to declare war on Bohemia on January 1st. Well, okay, January 2nd, 1550, with the help of France. To humiliate the emperor and destroy that institution called the Holy Roman Empire, Polish forces must occupy the following provinces. We have captured and burned the new Czech capital, and now we are marching towards Munich. The empire is weak and divided. The majority are already Protestants and Calvinists. Vienna itself falls very quickly. Our Hussar armies can move towards the next capital. Nevertheless, one army must retreat to Crimea to suppress those rebellions that took advantage of our absence from from Poland and the Polish Hussars, under the leadership of Jan Kazimierz Herbut, are attempting to intercept the allied forces of our enemy, which they catch and break without much difficulty. The Czech population in our country seems to support the war as they are hosting a ball to commemorate the occasion. With the fall of the capital of Mainz, the Holy Roman Empire has become so weak that the Polish ruler formally dissolves it. The end of the Holy Roman Empire is imminent. With the fall of Vienna, Archduke Frank Karl had to accept the final defeat at the hands of the Polish forces. In 1551, the once prestigious Archduke signed the abdication of the Holy Roman Empire and released all the imperial territories and officials from their oaths and obligations towards the empire. The empire finally found its well-deserved rest as the conflict with Bohemia continues because for some unknown reason, Great Britain decided to support them. So to ensure that the Polish forces are not wasted, our ruler sends them to conquer Moscow. After all, we have many claims. Unfortunately, the Muscovite troops, as usual, flee solely from the Polish army. But that might be because there are really few of them. Our Grand Marshal Stefan has also dissolved alliances with the former electors of the German Empire because such weak allies are of no use. And unfortunately, after this defeat, Moscow went bankrupt but had to cede many territories to Poland. The newly acquired territories with Muscovite culture are completely razed and plowed. We do not want that culture in our country. However, Novgorod culture suits us just fine. After all, they were merchants. The plundered goods were used to develop the port in Riga, and the Moscow capital was invested in building courts throughout the Commonwealth. Novgorod culture becomes an accepted culture in the empire. The fall of Vienna, who would have expected it? In the meantime, Poland finally removes Lithuania from the map. 
which in the end gives us quite a nice inscription. Meanwhile, Henryk Krasicki became the new Marshal of Poland. Unfortunately, he was a rather greedy ruler. He was so greedy that he led us into a war with the Ottoman Empire under the pretext of securing the old Hungarian territories. Well, Christian faith still persists here, and it must be protected from Sunni influence. That's why this conflict gained justification in the eyes of the people. Two smaller armies struck Hungary to secure it, where the Hungarian armies were completely defeated. Polish Hussar troops marched straight to Constantinople, and the forces under the command of Zygmunt Kazimierz moved towards Kutaisi to secure it. But the Ottoman forces appeared, and will there be a battle at Dagestan? Dagestan? Durban? Well, in which we inflict significant losses. Interesting. Can I negotiate a separate peace? That would be quite favorable for me. Time for a major battle with the Ottoman Empire. Unfortunately, on quite unfavorable terrain. But we'll manage somehow. Oh, here we suffered losses. Herder Hussars. The Ottoman army was completely annihilated and the war with the Ottoman Empire ended as a great success for Poland. We regained Wallachia. We secured the rest of Crimea. And a substantial amount of money flowed into the Polish treasury. And we inflicted devastating losses on the enemy. The Polish state began improving relations with Wolgast until the moment of making it a minor vassal. The same approach was taken with Rugen, which is a pirate republic. Clearly, they are not pirates. And this was a preparation for the invasion of Brandenburg, where literally the entire army was trapped on the island of Rugen. So the Polish merchant fleet blocked their passage. And then the Polish hussars struck that army. One must admit they have quite a formidable army, which nonetheless is completely destroyed. On to the next ideas. The Polish ruler chooses religious ideas to facilitate the conversion of conquered territories and the cheaper spread of Polish culture there. Meanwhile, the Polish merchant fleet sinks the Brandenburg naval fleet and captures one heavy ship. After the fall of Stockholm, the Polish army engages in the Battle of Daliskogen with the Swedish army, where they also completely shatter it. However, the Swedes are not the main target in this war, because the real objective is to weaken Brandenburg and reclaim Lusatia for Poland to release Szczecin, which, out of gratitude, forms an alliance with Poland. And later, it's possible that these two countries will form vassal ties. In 1575, Poland must take advantage of the weak ruler on the Moscow throne. That's why they declare war on her to conquer further territories with Novgorod culture. Investments have also been made in the former Wallachian territories, building a mighty bastion, and the former Czech and Hungarian territories have been incorporated into the Commonwealth. The decision was also made to establish new states with low autonomy in the territory of Hungary and all of Czech lands. As usual, the Muscovite forces flee to Siberia at the sight of the approaching Polish army. But despite that, the Polish hussars managed to engage the Muscovite army in the battle of Archangel, annihilating them completely. And thus, Poland gained access to the White Sea, cutting off the Muscovites from that sea, and securing the southern border against a potential Ottoman invasion. Such a powerful country could no longer be referred to solely as Poland. After all, it is a land of many cultures. Although Polish culture was indeed promoted, hence a new political entity called the Commonwealth of Many Nations was created. This allowed for the formation of a country with new powerful ideas, from the manorial system to the utilization of the Jagiellonian University, which by the way, has already been established here. So the Commonwealth still possessed truly powerful military ideas combined with economic ones. And it was a country of great prosperity. New possibilities stood before Poland to move further east after securing Lithuania to expand further west and to secure the ports of Pomerania perhaps even the re-establishment of the Byzantine Empire. Under the rule of Poland, of course, Polish culture is being introduced in territories with Belarusian culture, and in territories with Ryazan culture, Ruthenian culture is being promoted. The Polish ruler, enticed by the vision of recreating the Roman Empire, this time a Polish one, declares war on the Ottoman Empire. An army composed of hussars marches towards Constantinople, while the others move to occupy the Balkans, and one army heads towards the Caucasus. Will the Sultan personally lead an army against us this time, though there may be some smaller skirmishes along the way. And thus, the Sultan gathered his army near Constantinople, and our light cavalry strikes at that army. Wow! The Sultan's forces truly have no chance against us. It seems like the Sultan's armies are somehow surrendering. They are waiting for the arrival of the Hussars. Regardless of a few setbacks during the battle, we still crush them. And thus, as a result of this war, Poland achieves all its claims plus a substantial amount of money from the Sultan. The losses during the battle are negligible. Burning Constantinople gives us some extra points, but with the spoils of war, there will be a significant expansion of factories throughout the Commonwealth, and Poland becomes the greatest empire in the world. And if you want to see how to create a powerful Spanish colonial empire, I invite you to watch the first episode of the new miniseries. In the first episode, I show you how to deal with the Castilian civil wars properly.